Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. According to a No Cochrane review, people eat and drink more when portion sizes are bigger and or when food is presented on bigger plates. And I don't think that surprises anybody, but the review included the results of 61 studies with over 6,700 participants. And the researchers noted that overeating increases the risk of so many d diseases, mainly because it leads to obesity, which is a common denominator for many, many diseases. So they went to look at interventions that involved altering factors like plate size, portion size, and external stimulus in places like restaurants, bars, and houses in order to determine the effect on eating behaviors. Um, this information is important, I agree, because these things are all influences on eating and weight status and they go beyond conscious choice and they can be changed if people are aware of them. So according to Dr. Gareth Hollins, one of the lead researchers, people may think it's obvious that larger portions lead to more eating, but there's never been a systematic review that consolidated all the evidence and took a look. And he also said that many people think that being overweight is just a lack of self-control or other character flaw, when actually it's much more complicated, and I agree. I think the average person has no idea the invisible forces that encourage eating, and I've been subjected to it and fallen victim to it myself, which I'll come back to in a second. The review found that people consistently eat and drink more when confronted with larger, larger size portions, larger packages, larger tableware, and the effect was the same for men and women. It was also the same regardless of the BMI of the individual, hunger status, or the subject's declared intention to control their eating behavior. In other words, the environmental invisible factors, because we're not often real conscious of the fact that this is bigger than this or there's a pricing advantage to buying more. I mean, we act on those things, but we don't think about them. But the environmental factors override the, overrode the individual's stated intention to change their behaviors. All right. Several of the studies included in the review were conducted by Brian Wansink of Cornell University. He's the author of Mindless Eating and his team and he and his team have been conducting research um, around this area for a lot of years and in many settings. In fact, I use his book, Mindless Eating, as a textbook in some classes I teach. Um, they've consistently shown that not only do portion sizes influence eating behaviors, but the pricing of food does too. Grocery stores and restaurants and movie theaters and other venues often price food and drinks in ways that tempt people to purchase larger quantities. And once they do, you know, people have a tendency to think, why well, should I bought it? I don't want to let anything go to waste. We've all done that, right? Okay, so, so here's the thing. Sometimes this does work in our favor. I've noticed that our local Kroger store um, does a lot of specials like, you know, four points, pints of, black, of uh, blueberries for $5. Now that's a pricing advantage that's good for your health. But when they do the same thing with potato chips, nah, not so much. All right. The Cochrane reviewers suggested several ways in which this information could be used to help people, including reducing the availability and appeal of larger size portions, setting upper limits on um, the serving sizes of foods, changing the sizes of plates and glasses, and demarcating single portions by wrapping them separately. And that's being done, this um, you know, 100 calorie servings of various things and little packages, that's being done. They also suggested regulating the price of larger sizes so that larger portions don't cost less, restricting promotions of larger sizes and favorably priced packages of foods or drinks, they said that if this could be done, the, re, um, the average calorie intake in the United States would go down by between 22 and 29 percent, about 527 calories a day. Now here's the problem. These suggestions don't have a lot of usefulness in a country like the United States because government theoretically is not supposed to interfere in private industry. Um, and, and several attempts to do this, you know, limit soft drink sizes in New York. I mean, there's no evidence that that kind of stuff actually helps anyway. But I think what we can do is use this information to educate people so that they can become more conscious about it and change their behaviors. Um, one thing that, that I mentioned before that I've fallen victim to this, and, and here's what I mean by this. I have a weakness for pretzels. All right, I could have a weakness for worse things, but I really love pretzels. Okay, so pretzels come in all different sorts of bags. And by the way, I don't keep them at my house because if the pretzels are at my house, I will eat the pretzels. All right, here's my point. When you go to Trader Joe's and you buy a bag of this pretzel that I like, it's about an eight ounce bag of pretzels. 
And Kroger has a similar product, and it's a 12-ounce bag of pretzels. But here's what I've noticed. If I have 8 ounces of pretzels or 12 ounces of pretzels in the house, it doesn't matter. I've finished the pretzels in three days. No matter how big the bag, they're gone in three days. So I have seen firsthand more availability of the food leads to more intake of the food. And so I don't keep pretzels in the house. And by the way, that's one of the strategies that we've used for years to help people control their environments at their homes and offices. Don't have the stuff around. You know, if I don't want to chow down on pretzels, which again, I could have worse things to, you know, be a weakness, but instead of eating pretzels, I need to eat beans and rice and soup and an extra veggie wrap. And I can think of a lot of things I should eat instead of pretzels, so just don't have them in the house. So awareness, you know, you start thinking about this more. I know since I read Wan Singh's book and I started teaching it in classes, I've been much more aware as I'm wandering around and looking at even menu items, you know, the large size and the small size. Sometimes I'll ask, how big, if I've not been at a restaurant before, how big is the small size? And they'll, they'll say, oh, yes, about that. Okay, well, I'll have the small size then. I certainly don't need the one that comes in the trough, all right? So awareness is the key. So think about these things as you're wandering around, and I'm sure you'll see some influences on how much you eat that you could do something about. All right, let's talk about drug reps, one of my favorite groups of people to pick on. And let me just start by saying this. Marketing is an important part of building a business, and if it weren't for marketing, Wellness Form Health wouldn't be in business. I would not be talking to you today. But I have always taken issue with the way that drug companies market their products because drug reps have a lot of influence over doctors, and indirectly through doctors, a lot of influence on patients. Adrian Fugue Berman, medical doctor, who is with a, a, a nonprofit group called farmedout.org, presented a workshop at the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine's Summer Conference on Cardiovascular Disease this year about this issue. And she reported that drug reps are given a lot of data about the drugs that doctors are prescribing, but they're also given a lot of information about the personal lives of doctors, which helps them in building a relationship. Well, today about 66,000 of these well-educated drug reps are calling on 900,000 doctors, which translates to about one drug rep per 2.5 targeted docs. I mean, if all I had to do 365 days a year is talk to 2.5 people, I could talk them into a whole lot of stuff. That's a lot of time, right? Targeted docs, by the way, are high prescribers, docs who influence other doctors, members of formulary committees, and medical school teachers. Isn't it good that they're getting to the med school teachers so we can indoctrinate about the drugs early in the career of doctors? One way in which drug reps influence doctors is to provide gifts, which include free samples of drugs, pens, notepads, meals, golf outings, and other entertainment. And according to Fugue Berman, giving gifts to doctors is an accepted practice. And it's hard to wrap your head around this, but the American Medical Association accepted a $500,000 gift from the drug companies to promote guidelines for accepting gifts from drug companies. Okay, so, <laughs> I mean, sometimes you just got to laugh at it, all right? And Few Berman says studies shows that, show that the uh, gifts do make a difference, and doctors will say on the one hand that they're not, they're not in, uh, influenced by gift giving. But the research shows that they absolutely are. And believe me, drug companies wouldn't employ 66,000 people in their army if it wasn't making a difference. Things are changing. Um, research shows that drug reps aren't starving and the drug companies aren't going to go out of business anytime soon. But more doctors are declaring their independence and not allowing drug reps to visit them at the office or to purchase meals and give them gifts and that sort of thing. But according to a new report, 47% of prescribing doctors were considered accessible compared to 80% in 2008. So that's a, that's a big drop, all right? Now, it would be great if all of this drop in accessibility was due to doctors becoming more aware of the ethical issues involved, and that's the case for some, but unfortunately not for many. In 2014, this is kind of a cool thing, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services started the, quote, Open Payments Online Database, and this is a good place to go and, and look at information. Its first posting showed that $3.5 billion was paid to 500,000 doctors for speaking fees, consulting fees, and stake ownership in, a six, in, in a one period of time between August and September of, um, of 2013. The Open Payments website stated that drug companies spend $20 billion a year to woo doctors, which yields about $300 billion in annual sales. That's a pretty good return on investment. I wish I could do that here at Wallace Farm Health. 
Now, some doctors were not real pleased to see the payments made to them by drug companies posted on the website, and they were further more embarrassed when local newspapers started publishing articles about docs in their area that were um, uh, beneficiaries of the drug company's largesse. I know here in Columbus, the Columbus Dispatch featured a list of Central Ohio doctors who were the biggest recipients of drug company payouts, and then they interviewed doctors who then tried to defend the practice of taking the money, and, and I'm sure some doctors, uh, you know, this went on all over the country when this first started, uh, might have said to themselves, you know, it's probably not worth the hit to my reputation, particularly those that weren't taking a whole lot of money. Another factor, though, is centralized purchasing for hospitals and other institutions. Whining and dining doctors who are part of these systems is not as lucrative because they have little to, individually, they have little to no control over which uh, drugs are used system-wide. Decisions are made by committees who are very conscious about cost containment and much more conservative about the latest and greatest drug, which also can be the most expensive drug. The report concluded that, quote, this is, a, this is a quote, pharma companies may be losing their most effective tool, but they have other tools available. They just need to become more adept at using them. Well, let me tell you, the drug companies are not going to let this $300 billion a year market go. They will become adept at finding other ways to influence doctors. But here's how consumers can protect themselves. I, I think it's fair to ask a doctor, what is your policy with regard to drug reps and drug companies. Do you let drug reps come in here and uh, pay for lunch? Do you go to golf outings? Um, do you take free samples? You can look around. I've been in doctor's offices where every pen, pad, office supply is stamped with Pfizer, Merck, something like that. Always makes me nervous. In my opinion, it's a clear conflict of interest when doctors allow drug reps to entertain them and when they accept speaking and consulting fees from companies who make the drugs they prescribe. And it doesn't mean that all of the recommendations doctors make um, who are on the payroll are wrong, but I think a consumer has a right to know that. And, um, and also to take into consideration that information. I've seen some ridiculously enthusiastic recommendations for taking drugs that simply were not good for people. Uh, I mean, very little benefit, all risk, and then you find out that the prescribing doctor is on the payroll for the company that makes the drugs. Inexcusable, but the patient can ask and find out. And any doctor who's offended by the question, I think you get up and you walk out. That's a sure sign that something's amiss. All right, that's all for today and for the week. As always, pass this on to anybody else who you think would enjoy watching it. And I'll be back to you next Tuesday with more news.